All right, so um, as you may have heard, or maybe not, um, we are going to modernize the uh, Galaxy API and uh, with it the backend to really make use of some of the really cool new um, Python 3 features. And all of that is only possible because we've finally gotten rid of uh, Python 2.7. So um, Galaxy is now fully Python 3 compatible. Uh, that was a long multi-year effort uh, led by Nicola and many others of the community, many sprints, many hackathons. And now we get to actually use cool new Python 3 things. Um, and the Galaxy API does need some modernization. Um, so one of the biggest problems we have is that there's currently no way that we can do uh, work outside of the request cycle. Um, so that means, for instance, if you want to delete a thousand data sets, um, then those thousand uh, data sets you know, you, you send a, a delete request and then the backend does its work and the front end waits for a response and probably is going to time out. And there are clearly better ways to handle this. So uh, deleting is an uh, example that immediately came to mind. Um, there's also the issue that if you submit thousands of jobs, um, you know, it's a single post request, but uh, it just takes a while um, and this is not good. Uh, it's not good design. It's also not good user experience. Like we would want to know, hey, um, this thing legitimately takes a while if you want to create 10,000 jobs. And I'm currently at uh, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. This is ideally how it would be. Um, but that's something that uh, would be complicated to implement uh, with the current architecture. So of course we could start background threads, but you know just starting a new thread for these kind of things is um, not a good idea. I mean the, the number of threads that we can start is limited, um, and that's actually something that the you know Python developers have also recognized. And um, there is new now the async IO uh, event loop integrated in Python. So you know you can you can do things basically in threads but they are much more lightweight. So you can have many more um, threads. Um, and overall, we should break the application apart so that we can, um, we can create real uh, salary workers for things that are going to take a while. So Galaxy, you know, whenever something is supposed to happen, uh, you, you do a request and you get back, you know, either the response if it's immediate, or if not, you get back uh, an ID um, that you can pull and see uh, what is the status. Or even better yet, we register something in the backend and you get an event sent from the server when something happened. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is another example. So, um, you know, when you look at the Galaxy history, what the client does is it sends a lot of uh, requests to the history content um, API endpoint uh, it includes a timestamp and it asks, um, has any new data arrived or has any data been modified? And we do that, um, yeah, I mean, we, we do that a lot. We do that, I think, every three seconds, uh, very periodically. And that is traffic that just is pointless. I mean, it doesn't do anything and there would be much better ways uh, to, to handle this. Um, and that's also something uh, that you know, by modernizing the backend, uh, we can finally address. So one really cool way to handle this is um, subscriptions. Uh, subscriptions are not really uh, standard REST, but they can be served by uh, GraphQL um, and WebSockets. So um, Galaxy can just send out an event, hey, something happened, um, and whoever's interested can uh, listen to these events. That is much better than um, polling. Um, and you know, there, there are also other techniques. It doesn't need to be web server. It can also be server sent events, uh, long polling. All these things are more efficient if we can use um, async IO. And then there is another thing that I think uh, limits Galaxy adoption as, as a, you know, um, as, as a work engine for genomics informatics, which is 
Uh, our API documentation is, I mean, I'm saying not great. I mean, it could be better, right? Uh, so it's relatively unstructured. Everybody's using doc strings, right? We have rocks, doc strings for our um, API routes. Uh, but, you know, a lot of arguments are also repeated, so they're not listed in each of the doc strings. So I think um, generating API documentation from doc strings is inherently limited because they're not going to copy paste all those arguments um, around. And then for the user, you read those um, API documentations and they're like basically not super useful. So uh, our stance so far has been, well, Look at BioBlend docs, they are well maintained, but they don't cover all of the API. Um, or you need to go read the code, which is, you know, not a great thing. Uh, people should be able to build Galaxy clients without needing to read the Python source code. Um, yeah. Um, and there's also not really any type of information on what the things that are returned by the API are, are actually. Like, um, a common thing that we see is that um, there is a data set returned. But what is this data set? Is it you know, the data set that corresponds to a data set on disk? Or is it the data set that is a history data set association? You know, these kind of things, I think, are um, for us developers, that might be something we know, we've learned, uh, we, we've looked at, we, we've maybe seen the, the database schema. But for somebody consuming the API, this is just super confusing. Um, and there's no linking between the objects that are returned. Uh, so all of this can be addressed with OpenAPI. And uh, OpenAPI is something that is really built in into uh, FastAPI. Um, and so we get like really uh, nice looking documentation. Um, so this is actually, oops. This is actually from a Galaxy instance that has already some of the migrated new uh, routes. So this is already using FastAPI. So if at that Galaxy instance, you go to slash docs, um, you get uh, the individual routes, you can expand on them, you can click them, uh, you can try them, you can change parameters. Uh, so here it's, it's, um, it's a little, Okay, this is, this is better. It's a bit small, but um, here's an execute button. And then you get the result back here. You can change parameters. Um, you can see models. Um, so fully annotated routes annotate what they return. This is what I was talking about before. And it tells you what, what these things are and how they uh, relate to each other. Um, and I mean, there's, there's a ton of advantages to open API. Um, another possibility is that uh, there are translators, so you can take the open API specification and like automatically build skeletons of client libraries. So this could, for instance, uh, in the future become the base for BioBland or for, you know, a Go client or for a Java client or, you know, whatever people want, because there's a huge amount of uh, available languages that can clients in different languages that can be generated from this spec. Um, yeah, so another reason why, so I mean, I guess the question now is why fast API? There are other ASGI frameworks. Um, and ASGI is the async equivalent of uh, Whiskey, the, the previous uh, standard that we've been using. Uh, so the documentation is really excellent. If you go to the Fast API homepage, so I've just taken screenshots here uh, from the left-hand panel of the um, documentation, and this is great. You can you can read this. This is uh, interesting. The examples are well highlighted. Um, we can really follow this quite closely, uh, and that is something that we couldn't possibly do for ourselves in that much depth. Um, I think. Yeah, we don't have the resources to do this. And I think for onboarding new developers that want to write API endpoints or improve something or add new functionality, this is like super important that there is good documentation. Um, and it's extensive. Like there are things that are common and things that are not so common. Uh, there's a full section on uh, security, on WebSockets, on GraphQL, and all of that is, um, you know, I mean, they give you the, the source code and you can just start it up in a small server 
I think this is really, really the main thing of like why I think REST API is a is a good idea. Um, yeah. So how do we do the migration? Um, the Galaxy API, I mean, it does a lot of things, right? So we couldn't just replace everything at once. Um, that's, I mean, maybe it would be feasible, but it, it doesn't seem like a worthwhile project. Instead, uh, we should, you know, build route by route, uh, go look at these things. And um, there, there are basically two ways Okay, let me back off, that, one, that was not a great start. So the most important thing is that we can do step-by-step. Step. Um, so I'm showing here sort of the core of how, um, how we start uh, starting a fast API app. Uh, so we pass in um, the old uh, Whiskey app. Um, we start a fast API instance. Um, we add some middleware and here's a Whiskey middleware, so this is part of Fast API. So Fast API can then serve um, a Whiskey app. And now what we do is we walk the uh, module where the Galaxy API controllers live. And whenever there's some object called router, so that's typically how you call um, individual parts of a Fast API uh, component um, package module. Um, so, yeah, I mean, these are instances of a class called API router, and you are supposed to call them router. So if there is a router, um, we include it in the app. And because we included it last, it overrides any previous route that is registered through the Whiskey app. Um, and that's it. That's, uh, that's the foundation. This means we can really go step by step um, and add new controllers. Or, I mean, we, we don't need to migrate everything. We can also, you know, uh, work on the routes that uh, we want to modernize, where we want to take um, take advantage of uh, async capabilities, where we need uh, web sockets or, or GraphQL or other things that are not really fitting within a Whiskey uh, framework. Um, and then, um, yeah, I mean, so this this is already in Galaxy. Um, it will be part of 2101, but if you want to work on uh, fast API, look at the dev branch, of course. Um, everything should go to the dev branch. This was going to be uh, more up to date. Um, we've updated uh, the um, API guidelines with some explanation and some uh, philosophical aspects. Uh, so this is a good thing if you want to start hacking on fast API. Um, have a look at the API design guidelines and uh, um, yeah, I mean, uh, Nicola recently added the regular building of the documents. So this is also up to date if you go here. Um, yeah, so how do we migrate? Um, one core thing is that we want to remove as much logic as possible from the API controllers and instead move that logic into uh, smaller functions that um, are living in the managers. So here's an example. Um, so so we, we need to keep those old routes around, right? So people are currently still starting their Galaxy service with Uwiski. Uh, we can modernize routes while keeping the functionality the same. Um, and we can do this by um, pushing everything out of the API controllers and into managers. Uh, so here's an example where um, some of that custom logic has been moved out into a controller, giving the much nicer, uh, smaller function. And here's the new equivalent. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is kind of the, the way that you can build uh, fast API routes. The only way we differ from what you typically see in the documentation is that we use a class-based view. Um, and the advantage here is that uh, common arguments can be uh, stored as, or common dependencies can be stored as um, class vari uh, instance variables. Class variables, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, then you add your uh, configuration for Fast API. So this is a, a decorator coming from Fast API. Um, you annotate what is being returned. Um, I mean, that, that's one way to do it. This, this is another way. And actually, we could remove 
that particular stuff, I think so that was maybe not the best example. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is this is all there is. So um, we are currently migrating to fast API, but this sort of thing is generally useful. Uh, it, it's really small, it returns a standard model. Um, and what is being returned here are pedantic models. So these um, offer type validation, uh, conversion, coercion, um, and we'll see more about that later. Um, yeah, so um, another core thing here is that a lot of the uh, functionality that we want is based on having uh, pedantic fields and models. Um, and models um, uh, are basically a collection of, of fields or models. So models can be nested, of course. So, you know, your history can have data sets that can have metadata and so on. Um, so here's an example of a field. So this is probably the most commonly used field in the Galaxy API, which is the database ID, which is a hash of the numeric uh, primary key of the object in the database. Um, and we can associate uh, certain things about it. We can say it's, uh, it's a string. We can say that, well, it needs to follow, uh, it can only have a hexadecimal uh, representation. It needs to be a multiple of uh, 16 characters. And anything that doesn't, uh, that doesn't fit this thing will be denied by the API and you will have a reasonable um, error message saying, why did this thing not work? Um, and also, you know, you can try that out in the documentation I showed earlier. Just put in anything that is invalid and the API will tell you it's invalid. Well, you know, we have a lot of routes in Galaxy that currently you put in something invalid and you either get a wrong result or you get uh, internal server error, um, which we see a lot with, you know, bots and stuff just automatically hitting our APIs. Um, yeah, and so um, on the right side here is a model and they're really easy to construct. Um, so each field here, you list each field here and you say what type it is. Um, and then you can add extra metadata. And that metadata will be available in your documentation. And this becomes also more interesting when we have linked models that interact with other models so that the developers are not completely lost. Uh, I mean, consumers of the API are not lost in what these things are. Um, so if you want to get started, uh, we have a couple of different ways in which you can currently start Galaxy under Fast API. Um, I kind of like this variant here, Python scripts, uh, F API, you give it a path to the config. Um, that's not actually a flag, that's my comment here. Uh, this is great for development because you can just stick that into your IDE and start Galaxy in your development environment. Um, there is more standard ways to start Galaxy. So uh, UVCorn um, is kind of the recommended driver um, by fast APIs. So you, so you see that in all the examples. So this is um, what you would replace the example in the fast API docs with. This would be how you start the Galaxy app. And that's important because this is also going to be the way that in production, uh, we're going to set up Galaxy, of course, at a higher level, this will either be managed by um, the run SH script that we currently have or something else. And then have a look at uh, an example PR. So I listed um, an example PR by uh, David um, Lopez from yeah, the Freiburg team. He's done, he's, he's new, he's done an excellent job on um, starting to convert different uh, routes to uh, fast API based routes. So this is a great example. Um, yeah. Um, John, do you want to talk about this? Um, I can, yeah. Um, want to is a strong word. Um, so I, <laughs> I, I threw a couple of slides together 30 minutes before the meeting started. Um, just about typing. Uh, well, maybe we should stop there because um, like, I guess we're gonna get into like backend architecture stuff. Is there any questions about fast API? Yeah. I guess it's, these are supposed to be fairly interactive. Um, Yes. Does anyone have any questions about the, the like the con controller level above or the the server components or API stuff? Sorry. So so 
this means basically you're one or the other, effectively, in terms of APIs, right? You you either are old or new. Um, yeah. So if you start with your whiskey, if you continue to start with your whiskey or paste or um, other whiskey service, then you continue to serve the old API. But we try to have the old API and the new API share as much code as possible. Um, we have an intermediate layer that uh, takes the Pydantic models and pushes them out over the old API. Um, so they behave similar, but you are um, you're not getting the new ASGI um, features there. Yeah, but the, the downside then, of that is that there are like all of the quote unquote new APIs have two implementations, right? So we've made the implementations as small as possible, but there are two sets of controllers for each of the new APIs. Yes. Um, but then, you know, when, when you do run under a fast API, you have the old ones and you only serve the old ones if there's no new one. Oh, okay, I, I see. So, so effectively you can bring it in as, as you implement things, because I'm just wondering how this works with the, uh, um, the, the, the web stuff. So the web stuff will use the old API until the- No, no, no. So the, um, when you start up Galaxy in uh, one of these ways, uh, I mean, Sorry, the, the UI doesn't stuff. care how it contacts the API. So, you know, it's just the API that decides, uh, I mean, the backend that decides how it wants to answer. And the specification are the same between the old and the new currently. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's actually another reason why we, why I think it's a good idea to document stuff more clearly because with open API, you have some standard ways to deprecate routes and arguments. So once we have that in place, we can also more aggressively um, change some things that are not great. Like um, I was showing you this kind of thing where we have queue update time, and then you need to go to the QV that corresponds in position to the same thing, which is like not very easy to build in whatever client you are, except maybe backbone for which it was written, but probably not even there. So uh, I had, sorry, I had a question, Marius. Uh, is it? Is uh, G uh, Unicorn co communicating with uh, Fast API through ASGI, right? Is that correct? So, uh, so, yeah. And then uh, ASGI, uh, or at least Fast API, wraps the old uh, U with, uh, sorry, the WSGI modules and serves it, and we can do async as well. Is that correct? Well, not in the same route. So a route is either, either sync or either, async. Right. Uh, right. Um, and currently all our fast API routes are um, also still sync or, well, that's not true, but almost all of them are still sync because we, um, we're using SQL Alchemy and we're using the ORM of uh, SQL Alchemy and that's not yet compatible with async IO. That's gonna come in the 1.4 release um, once that is out, we can uh, use the async mode in the async controllers. So does that entail another rewrite or just inserting uh, async await all over the place? Um, that's going to involve putting uh, async await where uh, there is something with uh, blocking code. So, you know, when you fetch models from the database, you have to use a weight. But um, the Pydantic models, so the Pydantic models can also wrap uh, things that are coming from the database. So if these are complete, they replace the serializers we currently have that use the ORM. Um, and so they get around that problem and should also be more performed because there's no more lazy loading and only fetching of attributes that we're actually going to use. Thanks. I mean, that's in theory how it should work, but we don't have an implementation yet. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, yeah. Um, so I have a question. Um, so it goes a little bit in the same direction, Mary. So the client routes will be replaced. They will be the same routes or they will be new routes for the for the fellow. They will be the same routes. Uh, oh. Currently, until we can like reasonably say bye bye, you whiskey. Um, everybody right. should be using an ASGI uh, driver. Uh, when that is the case, of course, we can start adding new routes or new mandatory routes, right? I mean, of course, there's a possibility that we have the client check what the server can do and then use maybe the new quill thing um, if it's there and the old thing, the fallback if it's not there. So for instance, if we add um, history update subscriptions, uh, we could of course check, is that possible with this server? And if not, we use the old polling mechanism. But after the migration period, we would remove that, yeah. And another question is, would it make sense to um, kind of transform the models first to Pydentic and then work on the API? Or is it better to do both like uh, successively, like step by step? Um, both make sense. I don't think you have to de uh, de decide. I mean, there's many places where we can use Pydentic models um, that don't necessarily pass over the API. Um, hmm. So yeah. Yeah, I also mean like for the for the database models we have right now. So we have this in the in the models we have like this uh, init.py, I think. I think mm -hmm. everything is in there. And um, I was wondering if we should or could replace that file first, basically, and have everything, all those database models. But maybe that's just technical how to do it. I was just curious. Um, no, I mean, it, it's an interesting question because we also um, got into the situation where we wanted to serialize a few things from the database without having access to the database, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, for instance, how the new uh, metadata generation works. Um, and we, you know, we wrote some custom uh, to dict uh, methods that just take the database model and turn it into JSON. Uh, so I think the right or like a better way to do this today, if we have Pydentic models, is to use those, right? Um, and I think we will continue uh, the need to have the database models. Um, and to have the Pydentic layer sit on top of it because yeah. there's different, um, different requirements from uh, the Pydentic models. So for instance, you may wanna serialize just a subset of fields or you don't wanna include the relationships. So then you can build um, models that only include parts of what you need to uh, return and build them together and like, yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think essentially if we can replace the serializers that we currently have, which um, are just taking the database model and then requesting one attribute after the other. And if that attribute is a lazy load attribute, it will trigger a lazy load for each attribute. Um, I think that would be a big advantage. And the other thing is that we can use those models um, for you know, getting things out of the database and into the database and validate things before as well. Am I understanding that there's a way to like connect SQL alchemy to Pydantic directly bypassing our models though? Um, yeah, I mean, you can get any, uh, you know, any, anything that can be serialized as JSON. Sorry, can you, can you ask your question again? Um, uh, well, it sounds like, I mean, I generally agree that we probably need to preserve the model layer, or what I, what, what I would call the, like, Sam, the in it, the healthy dot models layer. Um, but is there a way to just sort of, in Pydantics, to say, grab this out of SQL Alchemy and sort of serialize it directly? Like, is there a way to bypass, you know, what we're doing inside of our models for, like, performance or something? This is kind yeah, of what yeah. we were talking about with the GraphQL layer, right, Marius? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so, I mean, Pydantic has this ORM mode. Um, uh, so then it just takes things from um, the instance. Um, and my understanding of this is that it does indeed bypass um, 
the ORM. So I'm actually, I'm sure that it bypasses the ORM because in the async example in the fast API docs, uh, that's how it's done. They still use the core of uh, SQL Alchemy um, and they use the model definition, but they don't use the ORM. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's cool. So again, I mean, the, you know, I, I really like the fast API docs because they, they talk about these things, right? Um, and like, they are not, they are not books. Um, they're not super long, they're not super detailed, but they are enough to like, um, yeah, it, it's somewhere between inspiration and instruction. <laughs> I think they have the right length um, to look into these things. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, you know, I, I've been hacking on this, and I, I want to like, I, I do think to Sam's original question, should we be working on the back end first? I mean, I don't necessarily think we should be replacing the models first, but I do think that there's a lot of value in um, basically we're taking all of our controller code and making it pedantic for that layer that says, here's the thing we're sending off to the user. So replacing all the serialization code, all the code that's in controllers, um, we can push those down to models push the views into Pydantic, do the input validation in Pydantic. Like, I think I'm getting nervous that we've converted a lot of routes and we're getting a lot of duplicated code and we still are a release or two away from like ripping out UWS GI. Um, so I, I do think um, if it were just up to me, I, I think we would be putting a little bit more effort into getting that backend ready, um, making those controllers all like really th as thin as possible and ready to just swap over. Um, but that's, that's just my bias. Um, I, I, I'm obviously not sort of eagerly waiting on the open API docs. I mean, those will be amazing, but I don't use them, right? So I'm, I, I guess that's really the benefit we're getting in the meantime by maintaining the two layers or the two different implementations is that we, we've got those nice docs in the meantime. Um, so that yeah. would be, but, and you know, just as like a, a playground experiment with it, but I, I do I do worry that we're gonna get to a point here where we've got too much duplicated code. As, as thin as we're trying to make it, it's still a lot of duplicated code. Um, but yeah, that'll be yeah. my like, sort of alternative answer to that. Um, so, I mean, you also mentioned that uh, we can only start, you know, really ripping out serializers um, once we make the switch, but you know, the way we do it, we should be able to do that today as well, right? Oh yeah, no, I put all the, you know, you can return pedantic models from our legacy framework. I mean, I, I added that. I thought that was a really cool idea. Yes. We've been doing that forever. Like, so you can take all the like existing controllers and basically make the backend look like it will be looking for fast API. Um, I, I haven't opened, yeah, I mean, yeah. So I, I think that's a good approach um, is to like sort of start at the layer just below the controller, right? Okay. We, we do payload and keyword arguments very ugly in the API. I, I don't even, I mean, I've written dozens of API endpoints. I still don't quite understand when we're getting keywords and when we're getting payload and when payload is a keyword. Like, um, so it's really ugly. And, and fast API is much better documented for all that. But I mean, if we could start at the, that layer just below it and get all that stuff ready. I mean, I think there's some examples now where we can sort of see, like if we get the controllers to look like this, they will work in either framework just fine. Um, and I, I think those examples. Um, I mean, I, I completely agree with you, and we should um, definitely pay a lot of attention to this during the development process. Um, I think the nice thing about also doing um, the fast API route is really the thing that um, we can get outside contributions this way um, because you actually do something, you can see something. Um, you know, as, as a developer, you can say, "Hey." You know this this thing now appeared because I did this because I actually went in and um, you know documented the things that need to go there. Um, that that's sort of my idea of why we should already start um, doing fast API routes. But mm -hmm. I, I I also agree with you. I mean, this is not exclusive. Um, yeah, it's a fair point. I I don't I don't disagree that that's very nice and it is very great to get that sort of visceral, like, hey, look, this, the documentation for Galaxy now works. That's awesome. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I mean, I wrote a bunch of models for the refactoring API, but I didn't change the top end, the, the top end. And, you know, the, 
they do make the Sphinx docs a little better. They're not like, it's still not good, right? But it's, uh, and there is a yeah. plugin to integrate Pydantic into Sphinx, but it doesn't work very well. I, but yeah, it's. So the other thing is that, you know, when we add new routes, we can already, you know, use the proper way to do things. So for instance, uh, I, I've done some work on adding this workflow invocation detail component. So you can see now the, the workflow invocation details. Uh, what is sort of missing is filtering um, invocations. So you want to look at like older invocations. So you need pagination, search, and all these things. So these are all parameters that have not been there previously. So that is also uh, an opportunity to add new things in the way we really want to do them. Uh, currently, and in the same way, I was talking about adding uh, GraphQL um, and web sockets. So these are things we can we can start adding them. Um, so that doesn't need to um, you know wait at all. And um, I guess one conclusion here is that we should push for getting rid of few whiskey as early as we can, right? Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's not fair because I've said this for years, but um, yes, me too. <laughs> and it's also not fair because I think our admins are not uh, on the Yeah, what is Nate? <laughs> the, perfect, the perfect venue for determining that. Can you talk a little bit I'm uh, about like, the, the uh, plan for like message queue and like asynchronous tasks. Um, I mean, I'm trying to help with the effort, but I, I still don't see, uh, is it like requiring unicorn or like I, how, how does this get us closer to, to having workers or does it, is it an, a sort of a parallel effort? I think, uh, and then correct me um, if I'm wrong, because I think you looked at this longer than me, but um, one of the things is that we traditionally didn't really have a good way to uh, start workers um, because you know we still wanted to have that run sh experience where you just type run sh and Galaxy is functional and working. Um, and so I think one part of the solution there is to decide on something that can manage these processes for us. And uh, the other thing is. Um, yeah, I, mean, I think that's that's the main thing actually. I have a PR uh, on Galaxy that adds a really stupid way of starting um, a salary worker uh, within the Galaxy process, which is of course not a good idea because we shouldn't get into the business of handling processes. But if we can find something, ideally Python based, so you can pip install it, uh, that can handle the basic um, requirements of starting processes in a coordinated way. I think that gets us pretty far. Um, the other sort of, um, um, let's call it potential blocker is we didn't used to have this dependency on, for instance, having a real AMQP server, um, RabbitMQ or uh, I don't know, SQS or whatever, uh, whatever salary can use. Um, so that's, I think, another challenge, but we've always required, uh, for instance, PostgreSQL to um, set up a production Galaxy instance. So maybe, maybe we have to say, you know, we now need our WMQ. Is, uh, you, I'm sorry, go ahead, John. Oh, no, no. Um, I, I just had another question, if you had another. No, oh, I, I was going to say, yeah, that just about sums it up. The crux of it was we had no way to start a real process manager. Um, so that should be, yeah, that's step one. And then once we can start a celery worker or a number of celery workers, there's real value in actually decomposing stuff. Until then, not near as much. Um, it, we don't have to be stuck on... RabbitMQ, though, I guess is what I was going to add there. Uh, we could we yeah. could look into other transports that we want to use, whether that's zero MQ, since that's what Circus uses, or any number of things. Um, this so I, I want to add here that I, I think zero MQ is fantastic. It's like super easy to set up, super easy to control, and I have a WebSocket 
subscription endpoint that sort of works. That's why there's no PR yet. Um, but like, you know, you can open a WebSocket in your console and you can see when Galaxy finishes the data sets. Um, and that's, you know, just adding zero MQ uh, messaging whenever uh, we also um, write things to the database. And that works across all processes because it's zero MQ. Um, I think the problem with zero MQ was securing it. Um, and that's, again, that's, that's also the problem with Circus. Um, because you know they don't really, really give you a ready to go recipe for securing uh, zero MQ, and that's that's probably not a problem for ninety nine point nine percent of instances where handlers just run on a single machine. But like usegalaxy.org runs it on multiple VMs, and so we need to figure out how we want to secure this. Does does that does that does answering that question limit us in terms of which um, how we run Galaxy? Like, are we is this going to be like we're going to want something that runs Galaxy that's also a process manager like Unicorn, or do you think that Unicorn could also work? I I don't. I mean, I was looking around and I didn't really have the impression that people use Unicorn to start salary workers, for instance. Um, whenever you look for that, people are using supervisor. Uh, but supervisor um, is a little, seems to be quite centric on this approach where you know you have it uh, installed system wide. Um, and I don't know why in the past we haven't gone down more of the supervisor route. So maybe maybe I should add uh, supervisor here. Yeah, can uh, we just run supervisor in user space and just? You get that with Galaxy? Yeah, I mean that, that would be another option. Um, I don't I don't know how people, how for instance the cloud team would feel about this, um, or you know how the admins feel about this, given that mm. um, they like System B. Um, so that that would be the advantage of um, Chaperone, which has a System D like um, interface and understands System D signals and um, these things. Um, we should so the, just yeah. start a big collection of options and <laughs> start adding data on a, on a big issue, I think. Yeah. And I mean, these things are not hard to set up. Um, so maybe we should just, uh, I mean, there's an issue. I, I should link the issue, but there's an issue on the Galaxy repo where Nate sort of spec'd out um, what we should be able to do. And uh, I, don't suspect this would be a hard job. Um, just trying how that will look like with Circus and Chaperone and Supervisor. Um, I get the idea that with Circus, it would probably be possible to stuff this into Galaxy YML, um, which might be nice. But might also be a bad idea, I don't know. <laughs> um, but you know, just having a single config file might be nice for our users. Uh, yeah. Shove it all in pyproject.toml. So, I mean, at least for the Kubernetes case, I guess uh, it would be preferable to have Kubernetes as the, uh, as the supervisor without having a separate process, right? So there is that. Um, and I, I mean, I was just wondering, is it an option to uh, just have a simple, like just if you run, do run SH, you just use an in-process uh, salary worker, which you kind of start manually. And then for a more production grade one, you have to start them up separately anyway. So yeah, that be a... I mean, that's kind of the, the route I went, except I started the worker uh, during the handler setup. Okay. But yeah, I mean, that would be, that would be another option, I think. Although, you know, if, so the, the cloud setup doesn't necessarily need to use this, right? So if we integrated this with RunSH or whatever successor to RunSH, um, you know, that's just the very light wrapper and coordination for starting, stopping processes. So yes, of course, Kubernetes could bypass that and go directly to the code that um, Circus or Chapter or Supervisor would manage.
It does seem, I'm trying to think about, it seems like we lost some time and some development effort, maybe even a significant amount, like investing in UWSGI messaging. Um, and I'm trying to think if there's like lessons we learned there and maybe, maybe I, and I don't know what those are, but maybe one of them is we spent too much time trying to get run.sh to be too production-y. And, and so, you know, maybe something to keep in mind going forward, but that might be the wrong lesson. The wrong lesson, the lesson might've just been UWSGI is, you know, not a good piece of software. Um, I think we also put our eggs in, in one basket and when, when that wasn't really necessary, right? So this uh, in-process communication, we, we went with the uh, USB protocol of these this messages that we could have easily gone with zero and Q, for instance. And then, yeah. I think that's a good point though. It's John's and the before that there's no reason just run.sh has to be anything but it's sort of a functional development setup. It doesn't need to be production-y at all. Um, yeah. And, yeah. Hey, Marius, can I ask a question real quick? Sure. You, you said you had, um, it sounded like an experimental branch where you uh, were able to open a WebSocket and sit there and watch data sets finishing off. Uh, do you, could you point me to that? I'd love to take a look at that and just see how it all kind of fits yeah. together. I'll, uh, I'll do it after the call. Excellent, thank you. I mean, it's like, I'm, I'm not sure I put it on the right place. It's probably all horrible places, but like, as an I just like to yeah. see how the parts connect, you know what I mean? Sure, yeah. So I have another branch that is probably very similar to Danon's branch for GraphQL. So I think this, this sort of thing probably goes together that um, we manage the subscriptions with GraphQL because GraphQL has language for doing subscriptions, which I mean, there isn't really a standard in, in, in a regular HTTP API. I mean, not that you couldn't do it, right? But um, you mean you don't want to replicate Q and QV in, in <laughs> In GraphQL, <laughs> no. we'll do that again. <laughs> exactly. I mean, that, that's exactly what I meant not to do because uh, there is like this standard way of doing it in GraphQL. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, hey. is there anyone that would like? to start working on this? Um, are there questions on like how to get started? I, I, I do have questions on how to get started, but I, I got here late and I got a feeling if I rewind this video, my answers will be there. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um, there's also this like slide just, you know, uh, probably went, yeah. It's all right, if somebody's recording, I'll just watch it again. Yeah, it's being recorded. I, I will forget to publish it for two weeks and then give it to Dave. And, but uh, yeah, <laughs> sometimes in, sometime in March, you'll be able to see the video. Well, sometime in March, you'll have your PR. Um, yeah, I mean, of course, also, you know, if you have concerns about this, then uh, let us know. Also, you know, if you don't like the approach or you think we should do something differently, like now is the time to do that. I, I just we're still to, trying to figure things out, so I just love to get an experimental subscription that replaces that that polling that I do. You know, I just love to try and try and generate one of those. Yeah. Uh, I do not like polling either. I noticed that one of these, one of the slides that was up here when I first came in was like, we do a lot of inefficient polling. It's like, yeah, we do, we really do, and uh, I would love to eliminate that. <laughs> So I don't know if there's no other questions, then uh, I guess I could say um, we need more people to present and not everything needs to fill an entire hour. Uh, so if you have small projects, um, get in touch. <laughs> that you wanna present or you, know, you have something that we should be working on 
or you want to make a case for something or against something. Um, and if it's just five minutes, that's totally fine. I mean, uh, but also uh, there are people who have requested to present and we've had like several full sessions and it's kind of like a boom bust cycle. It seems like we'll have weeks where like, ah, you know, we haven't got nothing and then several in a row, but yeah. Right. So apologies if you're hearing that and you're like, I wanted to present, but we're gonna get to you, but also we need more. It is Johnny. <laughs> uh, sorry, if we've got a few minutes, can, uh, and since we've got John here, it, does anybody mind if I ask some questions about the format of the Galaxy workflow files? You've got six minutes, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> So I'm trying to, uh, I'm, I'm dealing with some bugs on the iReader side. And iReader parses the galaxy.ta format and converts it into its own format. And then, yeah, a link builds an interface to uh, Galaxy, okay? And so things seems to change somewhere around uh, Galaxy 18, 18 point something. Um, so, uh, and I'm busy fixing things up at the moment which is forcing me to learn closure, uh, but where are things going with, uh, because I don't want to like fix everything up and then format changes again. So where are things going with a .ga format and what can we look forward to in the future? Um, I, I would say that Galaxy is going to continue to support the .ga format for the foreseeable future. Um, now we might, you know, we can now consume .yaml files if you want to build GX format 2 stuff. And there's a schema available to see what that looks like to some degree. We use that extensively for testing, et cetera. Planimo supports it. But as like, I mean, reproducibility is our thing, right? So we're going to continue to support the .ga format indefinitely. And if something, I mean, apologies if something in there broke. Um, we try not to break that um in big ways uh or, or really at all um sometimes there's some things we assume are non-functional but turn out to be functional you know depending on how people are consuming it um just because like something's you know not being used when galaxy reads the file back in doesn't mean you know someone wasn't reading it in a certain way uh but i mean i would i would not worry about dot ga files disappearing um we'll continue to be able to consume them i think um, even internally, the way uh, we implement, you know, GX Format 2 or, um, or CWL also is to convert something that looks native, you know, looks like those native models in the database internally. Um, you know, we, we, we take those external formats in, we, we tweak them to make them basically ex extended GA files, and then we consume the GA file, sort. I mean, that's a, that's a very hand wavy thing. That's not what really happens, but that's a sort of approximation of what happens. So I, I wouldn't worry about, I mean, I, I would feel comfortable continuing to support the GA files and fixing whatever that issue is there. Um, yeah, we would like to have better formats for, you know, reading and consuming and, and writing these things, but um, yeah, there's, you can't go, I mean, <laughs> going through the miserable experience of dealing with those GA files is, is, is gonna continue to work, um, so. Apologies for how ugly they are, but uh, that's going to continue to work. Is that is that a sufficient? And answer? is the is there any documentation about what's meant to be in there? No. I presume no. No. Is there any way to validate one? Anything like that? Um, Planimo Lint will validate it, sort of. Um, it will catch big issues, big glaring problems with it. Um, but yeah, that's about it. Um, it. And it won't it won't go through and validate tool state and stuff. So if you are got a tool ID and it you know it's got its its contents don't match what the tool is expecting, it can't catch that. The only thing that can catch that is loading it into a running galaxy with those tools loaded. Okay, I. Uh, I guess we need probably to end on time. So thanks everyone for coming. See you in two weeks. Go paper. Thanks, everyone. Hi everyone. Thanks, Mary. Cheers. Hi. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.
Thank you. Thanks.